everyone. I am Kimberly, the 5-Minute NP. The 5-Minute NP was born out of my belief that small, incremental changes can drastically change the trajectory of your life. Our genes do not have to determine our lifespan. My goal through this podcast is to act as a roadmap that bridges the gap between knowledge and action, leading to you living your healthiest, happiest, longest life. Welcome to the 5-Minute NP Podcast. Hello, everyone. I've been wanting to have a conversation on skin and aging for a very long time, and I can't believe I found the actual world-renowned expert dermatologist who has authored three textbooks on dermatology, cosmetic dermatology, and cosmeceuticals, Dr. Leslie Bauman. Her latest textbook is due out in a few months, and it covers all things dermatology, anywhere from acne to the science of aging in skin, including cosmetic agents used for anti-aging, exfoliating, moisturizing, sun protection, skin care, antioxidants, and cutting edge cosmetic techniques and procedures. We discuss many of these topics here on this podcast. Dr. Bauman also authored the New York Times bestseller, The Skin Type Solution, and developed the only scientific back skin typing system used worldwide. She also writes a bi-monthly column in the Miami Herald and regularly contributes to magazines, trade publications, and medical journals. I know you will love this podcast as much as I did. Welcome to the 5-Minute MP Podcast. Remember to subscribe to the podcast, like, and share it. My goal is truly to help you live longer, happier, and healthier. Hello, Dr. Bauman. Thanks for being here today. Can't wait to have this conversation. It's one of my favorite topics. Well, thanks for having me. I I love talking about science, so I'm very excited to talk about it. Well, I thought we would just start with your background, uh, where you're at, and um, move into, you know, your latest book and your skincare system. So let's just start with you and what we can learn about you. Okay. So I'm a dermatologist in Miami. I was the first academic cosmetic dermatologist. Oh, sorry about the beeping. But if I turn it off, um, then uh, I won't be able to hear you. That's but anyway, okay. I um, in 1997, I started the cosmetic division at the University of Miami. We were the very first medical school to have a division devoted to cosmetic dermatology. And that was because they didn't even have Botox back then. So I wrote a textbook in 2002 that was really the first cosmetic dermatology textbook. And it's in eight languages around the world. And I just finished the third edition. And I'm so happy because it's been 10 years since the second edition. And I kept putting it off and putting it off. And then during COVID, I had all this time. So I got it done. So it's coming out soon. And um, I am now in private practice. And I do research trials on Botox and fillers and all the injectables that you hear about. And my passion is skincare. And I have a New York Times bestselling book for consumers called the skin type solutions. So um, I spend most of my time talking about either basic science, injectables, or skincare. Wow. That is so cool. I was so happy that I found you. I'm like, you're the one to talk about all this stuff with. Um, Wow. So your last book, is that geared more towards providers or it's just Oh, that that's right? a great question. It's a textbook. It's the textbook that dermatologists use when they're learning how to do Botox and fillers and things like that. But this edition, I made sure that it um, is for anybody who wants to add injectables and cosmetics to their practice. So whether you're an MP or PA, a family practice doctor, or dermatologist, um, anybody wanting to get in the field, This teaches you how to do it, but also the background of the science. So it assumes that you're not a dermatologist so that you'll have all this background. Okay. What is the term cosmeceuticals encompass? When we hear that term, what is that relating to? Well, the cosmeceutical is not a real word as far as the FDA goes. So the FDA regulates things as either a drug or a cosmetic. So a drug is or a medical device. So something like Juvederm or Restylane would be a medical device. Um, Drugs are things like acne, prescription medications, and everything else is a cosmetic. And a cosmetic doesn't have to go through these rigorous trials. Um, Pretty much a cosmetic can say whatever it wants to, as long as it doesn't make a biologic claim and there's no proof necessary. Mm -hmm. So years ago in the 70s, Albert Kligman, who invented Retin-A, who was one of my idols, he came up with the term cosmeceutical to mean cosmetics that actually do something biologic. 
Now, although they're, the companies are not allowed to say these biologic claims, they're actually, um, so for example, we know vitamin C increases collagen synthesis. So it's considered a cosmetic, but we call it a cosmeceutical because we know it has a biologic activity. Mm. Okay. Um, well, while researching for your latest book, what surprised you the most about, you know, the science and what, um, what did you walk away with thinking, wow, I'm, I, I didn't know this, anything? Well, what I'm a nerd, so I read science and nature and all those journals every month. So I'm usually up on all the science. But until I sat down and wrote the latest edition of Cosmetic Dermatology, I didn't know about cellular senescence and autophagy. And um, in fact, I used to call it autophagy at first. It's (laughs) called autophagy, just so if you want to sound cool. And I didn't really realize how much that played a role in aging. Um, I knew all about sirtuin and the FOX1 gene and P53 and those things, but the science is really progressing quickly in the aging arena, which is thrilling for those of us who are getting older. There might actually be some great things coming in the next decade. Yeah, I can't wait to jump into that um, because there's so much information out there about fasting and all of these different ways to stimulate autophagy. So I can't wait to get to that um, science. But first, I thought it would be a good idea just because as a foundation to discuss your skincare system, because that is actually a good foundation to start with anybody with skin issues, right? Like acne, hormonal issues and aging. Right. I'm so glad you're asking me that. So my book in 2005 was called The Skin Type Solution. And that's when I first started talking about the system. I developed at the University of Miami because I know a lot about cosmeceutical ingredients. For 20 years, I've written a monthly column for Dermatology News. So people from around the world would come to me to get advice on their skincare. But I worked at the university. They didn't let me hire a lot of staff. So I didn't have an hour to spend with every patient. I had to figure out how to make it go faster. So I needed to get my staff or the younger doctors to be able to help me. But if I didn't I didn't trust that they would do it properly. And so I came up with this system that divides people into 16 different skin types. And there's a questionnaire that I took about a decade to validate because I wanted to make sure they diagnosed the patient properly, even if I wasn't there. So the patient takes a quiz, they find out what their skin type is, and then I can make the recommendations based on that. And that's how I've been able to outsource this to my staff. And now we have 280 doctors around the country using the system um, with software. And about three months ago, we made it available online at skintypesolutions.com. So now everybody can go and find out their Bauman skin type. And so when we do research trials, it's a lot easier now because we can recruit the right skin type into the trial. So the biggest issue that I see is that people will think that there's one product that's right for everyone or their best friend loves this cream. So I'm going to love this cream. Well, that's not the case. If your skin isn't the same skin type as your best friend. So one cream or one product isn't right for everybody. So you really need to know what your skin type is. And then it goes even further beyond that. It's not just about that one product. It's about all the products in the regimen and how they play together. So if you take one product and you layer another product on top, that's actually a third different product. They mix together and change each other and have all these chemical reactions. So every single step in the order really matters and it varies by skin type. So you can see how complicated it could be, but it's not with the software. So the doctors give the quiz to the patient and it automatically generates the right regimen for them. And they know without any knowledge at all that they get the right regimen in the patient's hands. 16 skin types is a lot of skin types. Like you only hear of the basic few, like you're oily, you're dry, you're acne prone. I mean, that's pretty impressive. But the thing about that is if you're oily, that's not the only problem that you have. You know, you might have dark spots, you might have acne, you might be allergic to things. So it's too simplistic to to go by the old system. And that old system was invented in 1945 by Helena Rubinstein. It hasn't been updated since uh, until my system was was developed. Wow. I thought when we reached like 40, we could be done with acne, 
But as I've gotten older, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. This is just not right. Wrinkles, acne, gray hair. This is just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and some people get pigment and you know, they get their relation gets worse. There's all kinds of things. I know that's just not right. That's why we need your help. Um, I did your skincare quiz and um, it's so cool. It's so easy. You just go on there and directs your questions you fill out as many as possible. And then it literally does tell you like what skin type you are and what products and how to go about getting them. It's super cool. And what I love about it is it's, you can customize your own regimen now. So you take the quiz, it tells you your Bauman skin type, and then it tells you what regimen would be my favorite if you were my patient. So it'll, let's say it's a cleanser. It'll say step one in the morning, use this cleanser. But then below there, there'll be all these other cleansers that you could choose from that are also right for you. So if you want a vegan product or you want something cheaper or you want to use something by SkinCeuticals or, or whatever your preferences are, it, now you can choose knowing that those are right for you. So even though it's super simple, the science behind it is, is very complex and it took really six years of testing it in dermatologist offices to make sure that we got it right. Wow. That is so cool. Well, speaking of cleansers real quick, cause I know we're going to jump into this other stuff. How important is a cleanser? Because it doesn't stay on your skin very long. And I kind of read on your blog and I thought this would be good to share because, you know, you think like, like how important is it and how often should we be doing it? But in your blog was really great because you kind of discussed you know, what is important about a cleanser? Oh, cleansers are critical. Do you remember what your skin type is? It was like dry something, which I was surprised because I don't feel like I'm that dry, but something like that. I'd have to look and I bet see. you're dry, sensitive, non-pigmented, wrinkle prone, probably. I said, yes. we're one, number yeah. four. Yeah. Yes. So we're number four. It's a hard one because um, we can get red and irritated from things and we any kind of inflammation is going to make us age more. So for us, a cleanser really matters. So the cleanser matters because it preps your skin for what the next product is going to be. So let's say we're going to use vitamin C. Vitamin C gets in the skin better at a pH of 2.5, which is a lot lower than your skin normally is. Mm -hmm. So if you cleanse with a low pH cleanser, like a glycolic acid cleanser, then that's going to lower your pH. And then that expensive vitamin C serum is actually going to work better. If it doesn't get in, you're wasting your money. Mm -hmm. It also depends on the cup, the type of water you wash with, how, what the temperature of the water is, all of that has an effect as well. And what kind of detergents are in your cleanser. Um, so cleansers are so critical, but if you're using warm water and you're using the right kind of water, it helps the cells kind of separate a tiny bit. And that also helps the next product get in. So the product that goes on after you cleanse is your most important product. I call it the treatment product. The one that you need the, the biggest, the most bang for your buck. And uh, so your cleanser kind of helps prepare you to make that product work better. Okay. Uh, well, what about the water? Because I heard that like waking up in the morning, putting cold water in your face is beneficial. Is that true? So again, it depends on your skin type. So okay. if you're somebody that's super dry and sensitive and you have rosacea, you don't even need to wash your face in the morning because you've already gone to bed, wash your face and gone to bed. And, and that friction and that water can really sometimes irritate your skin, wow. especially if you live in a place with hard water. Um, New York, for example, has a lot of hard water, which means it has calcium and magnesium in it. And that can really irritate your skin with detergents. So it's hard to answer that question without knowing somebody's skin type. So my big message to everybody out there is there are so many people who claim to have a skin typing system and so many questionnaires that tell you your skin type. Mine is the only one that's in the dermatology textbooks that doctors use and it is validated. I've spent years testing it all around the world. It takes you three minutes. It's free. <laughs> You don't have to buy anything. So just do it so you know. If you just know your skin type, you're going to make better choices. And that's my goal is empower people to make the right choices themselves. So it's just a little bit of knowledge that can go a long way. Yeah, it's super cool because my girls, they deal with like redness and everything. And I was just telling my 25 year old, I'm like, you're going to do this skincare quiz and figure this out. 
because they do get sold a lot of different products claiming that it works for everybody and it's expensive. And if it doesn't even work, it's frustrating. And also she's 25. She's probably thinking, what age do I start using anti-aging products? Yep. Well, that depends on your skin type and your habits. And there's lots of things we ask in the questionnaire to find that out. So if you're a tennis player and you're in the sun all the time, you need anti-aging when you're younger, like 18, because you're really getting exposed. If you're someone who works at night and you sleep all day and you're never in the sun and you, you know, and you're vegan and you get lots of antioxidants, you don't need anti-aging as soon. So it's very individualized. And so I'm glad she's thinking about her skin because prevention is so important. Yeah, no doubt. When you said about the effects of inflammation and food and whatever, you are so right. When I was going through such a hard time at my last year of NP school, I was full of inflammation. I was stressed out of my mind. I wasn't sleeping. I, I probably looked 10 years older. I'm not even kidding. I looked, my skin looked bad. It's so true. And I, um, stress makes your cortisol hormones go up, which may, raises your blood sugar. And that is very aging. So it also makes you hold on to weight. So it's funny because I, um, I like to exercise a lot and I'm always trying to lose weight because I love to eat and cook. Yeah. So recently I just um, got an Apple watch and it tells you what time to go to bed. And I'm a rule follower. So if my watch tells me to go to bed, I do. So my husband makes fun of me because I'm like, oh, my watch says I have to go to bed. But anyway, I'm starting to get seven, seven hours, eight hours of sleep at night, which lowered my cortisol levels. And I lost five pounds like that just wow. getting enough sleep. So all those habits really matter. It does. And the foods we eat, eat right? I was going to ask you about that. There are so many different debates on food and what to eat, what not to eat. That really is important, isn't it? It is. Again, it depends on your skin type. But if you have inflammation, there's lots of anti-inflammatory foods out there like salmon and flaxseed oil. And you know what I've seen that's really interesting in my practice is that people who are vegan uh, often have really dry skin because they're not getting cholesterol and a lot of the fats in their diet. Mm -hmm. So I've had somebody come in with you know horrible eczema being vegan. And all I did was tell them to add flax seeds to their diet and cleared them up. They didn't even need creams or anything. So it, diet can definitely play a role. Yeah. And that's stuff they could throw in a smoothie. Exactly. They just don't yeah. really realize that they're not getting some of the important fatty acids. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Well, let's jump into the science. But first, the skin, everybody is worried about the skin, but it does play a, a bigger role than just how we look. So how important or what kind of a determinant is the health of our skin saying about our internal health? Well, dermatologists like to think of themselves as Sherlock Holmes because we look at the skin for clues of what's going on in the body and um, we can find out and diagnose all kinds of things just by looking at the skin. So your skin's health affects, I mean, your body's health affects your skin and your skin's health affects your body. So I'll give you a good example. We know now that people who have rosacea or people who have eczema or long-term skin inflammation are at a higher risk for diseases that are caused by inflammation, like heart disease or diabetes. Mm -hmm. So no matter what your source of inflammation is, whether you're obese or whether you're eating too much sugar or whether you have an inflammatory skin disease, all of those things can affect your general health. So you don't want any kind of inflammation at all, if possible. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the biological, uh, changes associated with aging of our skin? Um, so you mean the basic science of the skin and, and what happens? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, in, in the textbook, I just finished writing, I have probably five different chapters that deal with this. So it's wow. super complex. So I'm going to just try to give you uh, a simple explanation, but it's not as accurate when it's simple, just so, so you know, but yeah. the, now most people know that you lose collagen and elastin and hyaluronic acid when you age. Hyaluronic acid gives skin the volume. So you, your skin looks thinner and not as plump when you lose that. Elastin makes your skin bounce back. So it sags when you lose that. And collagen is the infrastructure, the scaffolding of the skin. It makes it strong. So it becomes thinner and more fragile when you lose that. 
most people know that part. And that's why retinoids are so good. And that's why you want sunscreen to prevent that. Um, one little side note is you cannot replace elastin once you lose it. So no matter how many products pr promise that they'll help your skin elasticity, it isn't true. They cannot increase skin elastin. So you have to hold on to that elastin by preventing because you're never going to get it back. Wow. But there's a lot of other little things that go on. So if there's any science nerds out there and you think about the cell, you have inside your cell, you have the mitochondria, which is the engine of the cell. And it makes all the energy that your cells need to repair themselves to make that collagen and to make that hyaluronic acid. And the mitochondria um, is, like I said, the engine. And then you have the, lysos the lysosomes, which are like the garbage disposal of your, of your cells. So the lysosomes have to take all the toxins and all the broken down collagen and all the dead cells, all the stuff that your skin doesn't need anymore and digest that. When your lysosomes and your mitochondria don't work right, you age. And that is where most of the research is, is how do you get the mitochondria to work better? And how do you get the lysosomes to work better? Because we don't want all this junk building up in our skin. And that's the lysosomes. And to repair that and to make more collagen, we need our mitochondria to work. So when you have bad old mitochondria and lysosomes, your body naturally chews those up and eats those away. And it's called autophagy. Mm -hmm. Auto means you do it yourself. Fagi means to eat in, in Latin. So autophagy is to eat itself is what it translates as. So when your mitochondria and your lysosomes eat themselves and go away, your skin is younger. But when you get older, you lose that ability. And so all the research you're going to be hearing about is how to increase autophagy. And don't fall for buying any products because uh, they can't do it yet. They're still studying it doesn't keep companies from telling you that their products will do that, but they don't yet. We, unfortunately, they haven't figured it out. Wow. So what you're talking about when these cells are losing that, that is what it means when you're talking about cellular sen senescence, right? Kind of, but not really. Cause I'm talking about the insides of the cells with the okay. top. So when the cells, so cells can either be alive and happy and doing their own thing or they, they die, or there's this middle road called senescence. And that's when they just sort of hang around and they're not really dead yet. Um, we used to think they did nothing, but it turns out that they secrete all these things and um, they secrete bad things that cause inflammation. And um, they turn into the, the kind of cells they're called is SASP. And I always forget what it's called, so I wrote it down. It's senescence associated secretory, secretory phenotype, SASPS cells. So basically, those are senescent cells that secrete all these bad things and cause inflammation. So you don't want senescent cells around. And there are so many studies to show that if you can get rid of those senescent cells, you'll be younger. And this matters in things like diabetes because having a lot of sugar makes you age faster. And that's why diabetics get heart disease and have problems. So if you could block some of the senescence, you can help some of the side effects of diabetes and, and other serious diseases. So there's lots of research going into this. Now, back to your question, we, if autophagy isn't happening and you have a lot of these, these bad dead mitochondria and lysosomes that aren't doing their job, that triggers senescence and makes the cell become a senescent cell. So if we can improve autophagy, we could lower the amounts of senescent cells. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a kind totally. of Totally. Yeah. Okay. Because I remember learning about these senescent, senes I can never say it, senescent cells <laughs> that hang around. They secrete all these inflammatory chemicals that just do more damage to us, which makes total sense. And inflammation has seriously been proven to be the underlying cause of like you're saying like heart disease and all these things we're learning. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. So we want to activate this autophagy or stimulate it. But so how can we, what have you learned about us being able to do this? Well, they're trying all kinds of things. Some are actually even chemotherapy medications and all kinds of things. The one thing that we know works that you've probably heard about on the news is fasting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So when you eat less um, and it upregulates your sirtuin protein, our SIRT1, and that um, helps with autophagy and that helps with senescence. So that's why all those studies where they took the mice and they did calorie restriction and the mice let, lived longer, that was why. But, you know, people like me, we don't, we like to eat. So <laughs> there's got to be other ways. So luckily, there's all kinds of studies looking into how can you do that same thing and turn the cert one on without having to fast? So um, that, again, there's not, not a lot on the market yet. There's a lot of things people are talking about and trying, but each thing will have a benefit and a downside. So for example, you probably heard about metformin and people are taking yes. metformin to lower their blood sugar. That does help your, lower your blood sugar. But it also takes away some of the beneficial effects of aerobic exercise. So metformin might not be the best. So people are looking at uh, rapamycin and a lot of other things. But right now, uh, nobody really knows. But I feel like we're going to know soon because there's so much time and money being put into researching this. Yeah. And it's like, yes, fasting has been known to cause this, but then you go into, well, then how long do we need to fast till we actually can induce autophagy? Because I've read different things like, okay, you can start as in as little as eight hours. Okay. No, 16 hours. No, now you really need to do it for three days. It's like, no, not a lot of people want to fast for three days. Right. And back to my, my point about there's 16 different skin types. There's a lot of different body types too. So it's silly for us to think that one thing is going to work for everybody because they're probably different metabolic types and things like that. So with, um, with more of the genetic testing and things like that, hopefully they'll start segmenting people into these different buckets like I did with the skin typing system. And that would make it easier to, to try to find out some of these answers. Yeah, there's a lot. It's so exciting, though. But yeah, I have been reading up on all this stuff. And it's so interesting, like NAD boosters and all of this stuff. But mm. I feel like I'm a little nervous to really start taking some of those things, just not knowing the long term effects. I mean, how do you feel about that? Right, we don't know the long term effects. Yeah. And we just wait a little bit longer. So there was a study in nature probably two years ago um, that looked at epigenetics. And um, have you heard about epigenetics at all? I'm so fascinated. Mm -hmm. The way I like to explain it is your genes, it's like they have a cap. And if they have that hat on there, they act differently than if they don't have the hat on there. So when we age, that hat often comes off and we need to, if we could get that hat back on, it's called a methyl group, but I like to call it a hat. Mm -hmm. um, and when you can get that hat back on there, you can make the genes act younger. And they did a study in mice where they gave them DHEA, human growth hormone and metformin, and they turned the, their genes back, the epigenetics back by like 30 years. And so if they can do that in mice, now I'm not saying to run out there and take human growth hormone and DHEA and metformin yet, because we don't know the doses and all that, but if they can do it in mice, then they're eventually going to be able to do it in humans. Right. So I, but it makes sense because you've got the metformins handling the blood sugar. So the, that probably was part of it. The DHEA is more of a, a testosterone androgen hormone. So we know hormones are very important. I don't know what I think about human growth hormone. I have a lot of patients that are on it. And uh, if they stop, I can't tell the difference in their skin if they're on it or they're not on it. What do you think? Have you ever seen a difference with human growth hormone in your patients? I don't know. I haven't, but I know, I mean, one good way to get it boosted is by sleeping. Oh, does that increase your human growth hormone? Yeah. I think that's one big thing about oh. sleep. Um, oh, maybe that's why I lost that. Oh, I'm saying that right. But yeah, I think sleeping and I don't feel like I've read much on the safety of it. Um, so that's my, I'm cautious. I'm thrilled with epigenetics because I lost both of my parents young and I lived with that fear for a long time. So that's, those studies are huge for me. It's like, no, I can do these things to hopefully impact my longevity, um, which is why I'm so interested in it. Um, but yeah, I think honestly, some of the stuff is so simple, like honestly, get your sleep, you know, get the mm -hmm. exercise and it helps your skin. 
Right. And with the epigenetics, they absolutely know that if you eat cruciferous vegetables, which is cauliflower, broccoli, uh, bok choy, that that changes your epigenetics. And not only in you, if you're pregnant, it changes it in the baby too. So that is amazing. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. Um, Well, okay. So we've kind of really talked about the factors kind of that are associated with aging, obviously poor sleep, poor diet. Um, But let's talk a little bit about photo aging, because isn't that the number one reason our skin ages? It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, our age number doesn't really mean we're going to get a bunch of wrinkles. Um, It's the damage from the sun. Is that right? Yes. And that is one of the reasons why uh, when we do the skin typing system, your skin type result depends a little bit on your habits as well. So that's what we ask you about your habits. If you smoke or, or vape, or you get more sun exposure, or you don't wear sunscreen every day, that makes you higher at risk for aging. They believe it's hard to quantify, but they believe that 80% of aging is from the sun. They tried to quantify it years ago. I think it was in the nineties where they took people who use an SPF of five every day and tracked them and found that if you do that every day, by the time you're 70, you're going to have half of the amount of sun exposure just for the SPF of five. Now, I would rather use a 15, but the yeah. point is use something every day. Mm-hmm. And every day patients come in and they say, well, why do I have to wear a sunscreen if I'm not leaving the house? But, the, you know, we were talking earlier, you have a light that helps. And when you do Zoom, those lights, sometimes those are blue light. They're our computer screen right now is blue light. Um, our phone is blue light. We're getting aged by all kinds of lights. Hopefully mine up here are not. The ones in my office don't age you. I made sure of that. <laughs> but a lot of times that we're exposed to light that ages us all the time. And, oh, and, and pet peeve I have is the infrared. At my gym, everyone goes in the infrared sauna after they work out. And sure, it makes your muscles feel better, but it ages your skin. We I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> oh. it's, it's, it's so huge, apparently. Huge. So the infrared is not, is that different or is that what you're talking about? Um, well, any kind of light can age your skin. Okay. Um, but infrared is, you don't realize it's light because it's non-visible light. It's, it's heat. And skin SkinCeuticals did a study years ago looking at infrared and they did biopsies and looked at the cellular changes and proved that definitely infrared hurt, hurts your skin. So let's say you're a chef and you're indoors and you're cooking in ovens all day. I mean, sunscreen is going to help you because it help protect you from the heat. Well, maybe sunscreen wouldn't help you as much as uh, like a vitamin C or an antioxidant would actually. That, that would make more sense. Because it's the damage and the inflammation, not the actual light from the infrared. So if you're going to do that, you need you need to be eating vitamin C supplements and putting vitamin C on your skin before you go in the infrared sauna, in, in my opinion. So don't go do that. That's not, I mean, I was going to go had an appointment. I was going to go try it out, but I didn't end up doing it. Yeah, everybody's talking about it. I know. Swear by it, but just wait 10 years from down the road. That's another thing. Remember the when blue light was a big thing for acne, people would treat acne with blue light. Well, blue light ages you, it turns out. Red light ages you a little less. They have all those at home lights that you use to get rid of yeah. wrinkles, which don't, first of all, they don't work. But second of all, okay. they age you. So I'm not even sure how they get away with saying that it approves your skin. So definitely wearing sunscreen every day matters, even if you have dark skin. So if you have skin of color, a darker skin, like a Fitzpatrick four, five, or six, you Mm -hmm. probably don't wear sunscreen because it looks white or violet on your skin. But all kinds of studies show that your skin will sag more if you don't wear the sunscreen. So you may not wrinkle as much as lighter skin types, but you're going to lose that elastin and sag. And that's why we see the nasal labial folds and darker skin types get kind of saggy earlier than you would expect. And that that's why. So you, no matter what color you are, you need to wear a sunscreen every day. Wow. That is so good to know because yeah, you don't even realize it. Um, I thought we could jump in a little bit about a couple of things that I read. I found this article. That's how I found you was reading this awesome article and you started to discuss your findings on resveratrol and melatonin. Could you discuss 
what you found in relation to those? Well, resveratrol is known to upregulate CERT1, the CERT2 one. And there were, there's lots of studies going on with that, even at high doses, medical doses. I, in the future, I think they're going to come out with um, a prescription dose of that. But that was the early, so when they first started um, doing the dietary caloric restriction in mice and they found that they lived longer, then they found it had to do with CERT1. I can't remember who the doctor was. I think it was someone at Harvard screened all these natural compounds and to see what would affect CERT1 and found that resveratrol did. So uh, that's why they started studying resveratrol to see what all it would do. It, it's great. The problem is what we have is not really strong enough. So you can use it topically, but it's really not a, a high enough dose. So we're going to want to probably take it orally later. But that is what's in red wine. And for years, we've known the red wine had health benefits and it's probably due the, to the resveratrol. Mm -hmm. And then melatonin is a kind of a different story, but melatonin is an antioxidant. So that helps you. We haven't talked about free radicals at all. Maybe we should kind of back up and talk about free radicals a little yeah, bit. That'd be great. So most of the time people have heard of antioxidants and they've heard of free radicals, but they don't really know what that is. So the way I like to explain it is oxygen likes to have an even number of electrons. So they're in these pairs and they circle around the center of the atom. And then when something comes along like ultraviolet light, it will knock away one of those electrons and leave oxygen with an odd number of electrons. So that one that's by itself is angry. It wants to pair up with somebody. So it goes and it attacks, it pulls electrons from other things. It can pull it from your cell membranes. It can pull it from your DNA. It can pull it from anything. But when it steals that electron, that causes damage, which leads to inflammation, which leads to aging, like we were saying. So what an antioxidant does is it gives oxygen that electron back to calm it down. But once it gives up that electron, it doesn't have any more. So I, I like to use football analogies. You know, once you throw the football to someone, you don't have it anymore. So that's why you need a lot of antioxidants. You need to eat them. You need to take up supplements. You need to drink them. You need to put them on your skin because you need a constant supply of antioxidants all the time. And melatonin just happens to be another antioxidant. Do you recommend taking melatonin at night? Um, I, yes, I think it's a great thing to take. The only controversy is sometimes people, for a while, people thought melatonin made you get more pigmentation. So if you had melasma or dark spots on the face, maybe taking melatonin would make it worse. But then there were new studies that came out that showed that it actually helped prevent pigmentation. So we don't really know about melatonin and pigmentation, but we do know that it is a good antioxidant and it helps you sleep. Yeah, I, I take a low dose delayed release one, um, mainly just I wanted to start sleeping better. And then through COVID, just reading all the effects they found, I realized I'm like, wow, melatonin is powerful. <laughs> There's a lot to do with melatonin and so vitamin C, but what about vitamin E? Do you feel like that's important to supplement? I've read, I've read different studies on that one. So I feel like I'm a little cautious to, to supplement with that, like orally instead of topically. Well, vitamin E is a fat soluble vitamin. So they're different. The fat soluble vitamins are the, the ADEK, A-D-E-K. So vitamin A, vitamin D, E and K. So they're a little bit different, but the last studies that I've seen showed that natural sources of vitamin E are better. And if you take vitamin E supplements, it tends to prevent your body from absorbing the natural vitamin E from your diet as much. So that's why people don't really take oral vitamin E very often. Um, it also makes you more likely to bruise. So if you're going to do fillers or Botox or whatever, you don't want to be on vitamin E for 10 days. It makes your platelets not stick together properly. Okay. So that's why uh, vitamin E is kind of fa fallen out of favor whenever you do it orally, but topically it's great. It's also called tocopherol, but there's a subset of people that are very allergic to it when you use it topically, mm -hmm. especially the alpha tocopherol, which is the kind that's in the supplements. The supplements are these gel capsules. And um, when you break them open, the oil comes out, people would apply that. And they actually have a high risk of allergy. And, you know, the very first study I ever did in the 90s, it ended up in the New York Times because it was so crazy, is we took people who had had skin cancer surgery 
and we put aquaphor on one half of the scar and aquaphor with that vitamin E from a capsule mixed in with aquaphor on the other side of the scar. And we were blinded. And so we didn't know which was A and which was B. And we followed them and one side of the scar looked so much better than the other side. We were so excited that we have finally proven that vitamin E made scars heal better. But then when we unblinded it, it turned out the vitamin E made them heal worse. Wow. And they had a very high incidence of inflammation and allergic reaction to the vitamin E. So that was shocking. Now, when you burn yourself, vitamin E probably is still great for burns, but for surgical wounds, it ended up making it worse. So that's why research is so important. People say things, they try things. Anecdotal evidence means one one person says, my friend told me that vitamin E made her scar better. That's not the same as an actual study. So I'm a big stickler for data. So I think everybody should insist on data because there's so many false claims out there. On my Instagram, Skin Type Solutions, we have a factor myth at once a week. And we, we, we say, is this a factor or myth? And then in the comments, you could say what you think. And then we tell you the answer. And it's amazing how much false information there is on false beliefs. Like everybody thinks retinoids are going to make you sun sensitive <laughs> and they don't. Really? I did think that. Yeah. So that's because they are sun sensitive. So if I put retinol on and I go in the sun, the sun's going to break it down and it's not going to work. That's why you use it at night. But it, when the sun touches your skin and does all the bad things, the retinol blocks all that gene expression. So it protects you from the sun. Wow. You might feel like you're, you're burning, you might feel tingly from it, but actually, if you look at the molecular processes that happen, it's mm-hmm. protecting you from the sun. Wow. Now, is Retin-A the last thing you should put on your skin at night, or does that also depend on skin type? It depends on your skin type. So, okay. but, so if you're dry and you're very inflamed and sensitive, I, I think it's better to put you do the moisturizer and then you do the retin-A last. But okay. if you're a resistant skin type or an oily skin type, it's harder to get things in your skin. So then you'd want to put the retin-A first and then the moisturizer on top. And that's kind of like this whole skin slugging thing. Have you heard about skin slugging? No. <laughs> They're talking about it on TikTok. Skin slugging is when you put a a cream on or some kind of product on, and then you put Vaseline on top to slug it into your skin and really get it in. That's called occlusion. And that you could, uh, you can accomplish that just with your moisturizer. So you'd put a retinol or retin-A on and then put your moisturizer on top. But most people are not going to be able to handle the strength of the retinoid. So it really depends on your skin type and it depends on the moisturizer too. So the, well, fat, the fatty acids in the moisturizer matter a lot. With the Retin-A and the moisturizer, I thought I read, and this might be a myth, that you have to wait for it to sink in for like 30 minutes before you apply your moisturizer. Is that true? The Retin-A is like a, a hormone, so it gets in really easy. So okay. you don't need to wait. A lot of things like vitamin C or something... It, well, let me back up. If you design your regimen properly, you should never need to wait. Because every product should be helping the other products get into your skin. Okay. Um, so that it shouldn't matter. But if you're not using the right products together and you need to wait, you don't need to worry about that with retinoids because they get in so easily. You actually have the opposite problem with retinoids is some people that have an impaired barrier, like a dry skin person, their retinoids are going to get in too easy. And they're going to have a lot of redness and dryness. And that happens a lot with kids with acne especially dry skin acne kids, they'll get on their acne medication and they just can't tolerate it. So if you switch things around, put them on a cleanser that's very soothing and you put them on a moisture, a barrier repair moisturizer first, like I love Xerophyte. It's my favorite barrier repair moisturizer. They put that first and then they put um, the Retin-A on top. They should tolerate it. And that reminds me, you can tell I could talk about skincare all day, but that reminds me of hyaluronic acid increases penetration of things. So let's say you want to increase penetration. You're somebody that you've tried Retin-A and it doesn't do anything to you. Well, then if you put a hyaluronic acid serum on top of the Retin-A, it's going to really drive it in. But that's why these acne kids, you see them using these hyaluronic acid serums with their Retin-A and, and their, it just rips up their face and they can't tolerate the medication. So every single step matters in your regimen. 
Yeah, both of my girls have tried the Retin-A and you're right. It really dries them out. Like my older, my younger daughter, she's had a lot of problems with acne and um, currently she's doing um, Accutane, Mm -hmm. but like I've tried everything with her and the Retin-A just really was just hard for her to tolerate on her skin. And I kept thinking, that's the one thing I, I know that it works. I don't know how to, you know, fix this. Right. I wonder if you, um, I feel certain if her moisturizers and cleansers and everything had been right for her skin type, she might've been able to tolerate it, but I'm a huge fan of Accutane. I think Accutane is wonderful. And there's a new acne medicine called Win Levy that just came out that blocks the testosterone hormones on your skin. So now you were saying earlier about adult acne, um, that's because as your estrogen levels go down, your male hormones are um, balanced and high. So people get hormonal acne when or women do when they're older. And now there's this new drug called Win Levy that's not irritating at all that you can use for that. So wow. it's pretty new. You should check it out. Is that, um, is that available online or prescription? It's prescription. It's okay. Prescription. Okay, yeah. cool. And what about that moisturizer you were just saying you, you love? Is that something you it's, have it's on your called, website? Uh, yeah, it's Zerafite, Z-E-R-A-F-I-T-E. Okay. A Zerafite actually in Latin means something that loves um, dryness. So Zerafite loves dry skin and it is um, made, it was originally made for people with eczema. It has um, a technology that repairs the barrier that's very different than anything else out there. But they also have a, a soothing cream that's great for people with redness and rosacea. And they have a, a face cream and a body cream and an eye cream. So if you have dry skin, it is really the best. And it's not expensive. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that really is at that level is a prescription cream called Epi Serum. And it's $350 and it's prescription. So this is, um, it uses similar lipids. And um, when you look under the microscope, you actually can see this thing called the Maltese cross pattern, which shows you that it's the same shape as your normal skin barrier. So the Maltese cross pattern is is pretty cool that you can look under a microscope and evaluate a moisturizer that way. Wow. Now an oily person isn't going to like it though. It's for dry skin types. Yeah. Um, Speaking of hyaluronic acid, you talked about it topically. Should we be taking supplements too? I know a lot of the skin ones have it in it orally too. Is it beneficial orally as well? I'd love when you ask me these questions. So most of the supplements are, are not useful because they're not what you need. It's more a marketing. Okay. So hyaluronic acid is um, actually, it's just a sugar that you normally make in your body. If you take glucosamine supplements, which are a lot cheaper, that makes your body make your own hyaluronic acid. Wow. Okay. Same thing with collagen, all those collagen powders and drinks, everyone's spending a fortune for it. If you take chewable, cheap vitamin C supplements, you're going to make your own collagen. You don't need to be drinking somebody else's collagen. <laughs> I was going to ask you because it's huge. I mean, the supplements, the powders, everything. And I'm like, I, should I, we be doing this? But I love the idea of taking the other ones because then my joints won't hurt too, right? Exactly. The, the conjoint glucosamine helps your joints and your joints, it's hyaluronic acid in your joints, actually. So it's the same thing that you're making. So it's a great idea. And those chewable vitamin C's are wonderful. With vitamin C, you want to divide it twice a day because if okay. you take too much at once, it'll just come out in your urine and you just have expensive urine. So okay. it's better to do a little in the morning and a little at night. And then Cohen's on Q10, I'm a huge fan of. I was going to ask you about that. It's great. So it makes your mitochondria work better. So we talked about mitochondria as the engines of your cells. Mm -hmm. You need Cohen's on Q10 in that Krebs cycle, the chain that is, um, that you see in the mitochondria. And um, it is, um, the thing I always try to remember to tell people is if hypes you up because it gives you energy. So you take it in the morning, never take it at night or it'll give you insomnia. Okay. Like a hundred milligrams. I think I was reading up on this. Is that a good uh, dose or diff- usually 200, unless you're on a okay. statin cholesterol lowering drug, cause okay. the lower your CoQ10 levels. In that case you do 400. And you know what I realized it might not be this Krebs cycle. That's the one the mitochondria does. I might've confused my chemistry there. So if I did any chemists out there, I apologize. I have to look it up. <laughs> Bottom line is it helps. It's, um, the, it's the one that has all the coenzyme ones that the mitochondria does. 
So that's, um, should we do like 500 of vitamin C in the morning and at bedtime, or is that too low or too much? Um, 500 morning, 500 at night. Yes. Okay, cool. And then CoQ10, either 200 or 400, depending on if you're on a statin or not. Awesome. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground. I'm just trying to think if there's anything, um, that we haven't talked about. Um, a couple questions I want to ask you towards the end. They're just for fun. Um, but first of all, you're, um, you do not do virtual visits, but your staff does. And I feel like it could be so beneficial to get a virtual consultation with you or not just you, but your staff, they do that, right? Yes, they do. You call my medical practice. It's Bauman Cosmetic in Miami and, um, or derm.net. It's even easier if you go to derm.net and you can schedule an appointment and they also will use the typing system. So you'll take the quiz, you'll find out your skin type, They'll look at you on camera and they can talk about your skincare regimen. And I have a, we have six providers in my practice. So we have um, three PAs and three dermatologists. So uh, several of them do, one of them's on maternity leave, but the other ones will, will do the consult for you. Oh, one other thing. I mean, sorry to go back, but the hyaluronic acid, that is what is in the fillers, right? Yes. Hyaluronic acid is what is Juvederm, Restylane and all the fillers. And those last a good amount of time, typically. Yes. Uh, and that's because they take the chain of hyaluronic acid, which if you, it, it looks like a ladder. And if you stick those ladders together, it's called cross-linking. That makes it last longer. If you didn't do that, if you just took normal hyaluronic acid, it would only last 24 hours. So the difference between the fillers is how they hold those ladders together. And that's what I do is I do all those filler trials for the FDA. And there's all kinds of new ones coming out. There's all kinds of new toxins coming out. And it's really exciting, the, the field. You know, with COVID, it slowed down a little and we saw less innovation, but it's all picking up again. What about, um, is there a certain place we shouldn't have people injecting us with fillers? I just wanted to know because um, like in between here, I had somebody wanting to do that. And I just wonder like, is this safe? Is it not you just don't want anyone injecting you that isn't properly trained. And there's no rule about training is the problem. So it's hard to know who's good and who isn't good. Yeah. Uh, fillers are really safe in the right hands. So we don't, it's, it's very dangerous here. I'm not saying that I've never injected somebody there because sometimes people really need it. Like if they're in a car accident or they have a scar, yeah. but I I'm well trained and I know what to do. If something bad happens. Um, but it even so this is the nasal labial fold most fillers are are studied in this area mm -hmm. everybody thinks this area is so safe because we've been doing it forever this is actually a very dangerous area really? somebody doesn't know what they're doing yeah there's an artery that comes right here and if you hit that artery um you can get the so the way the blood supply goes up to this area you can get necrosis here we've seen it so many times people always send me their problems so no matter who you go to, there's a risk. So you need to go to somebody who's well-trained and knows how to handle things if they go wrong. Yeah. We actually had a patient who went to um, a local doctor or, or Medispa. I, I don't know if, who injected them, but they had a big problem and then they came to me to fix it. And when I tried to talk to the Medispa, they wouldn't tell me what they injected her with. Wow. And it wasn't that I was going to prosecute them or something. I needed to know to help the patient. And they just wouldn't even return our calls. It was terrible. So, you, so people are so price conscious, but they don't understand that you yeah. the difference in price. If somebody's cheap, you have to wonder why they're so cheap. They're either using illegal stuff, or they're not trained, or they're bad, so they don't have any patience. So, please do your homework. That would be my public service announcement out there, and make sure you go to somebody well trained. Well, there's not a lot of dermatologists where I live that actually do the injections anymore. I feel like it's more and more of these bed spas, which makes it hard. Yeah. And I'm not saying a Medispa is bad. In fact, my new textbook is I'm hoping Medispas are going to use it to learn all these things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not somebody who believes you have to go to a dermatologist over an MP or over a PA. I think it's about the training and the experience that they have and how open and honest they are. You need to trust they're giving you legal stuff and they're not cutting corners. So, you know, I have uh, three PAs that inject in my practice that mm -hmm. I personally trained and they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
But it's, uh, but again, I think the warning sign is if they're too cheap, you have to wonder why. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. So just some fun questions and then we'll finish up. What about facial rollers? Do they work? They work by increasing lymph flow in the okay. skin and um, by increasing lymph flow, you can get rid of puffiness. Those um, things that stretch your skin, like there's this brand called Paws, like Menopause, P-A-U-S-E, and it's, it has this um, little metal thing that you stretch your skin. That increases your fibroblast activity and can make more collagen. So we've known for a while stretching the skin can work. Um, so, but the facial rollers, you could do that with your hands. People love those facial rollers. I think they're <laughs> fun, but they're not really necessary. But, um, if, if you have puffy eyes in the morning, the creams, eye creams don't really work so well, just, um, massaging towards your nose. Cause that's where the lymph nodes are going that way. It can make a big difference. And if you like to use a roller for that, you can. Oh, so start at the outer edges and go in. Right. Okay, cool. And what about facial yoga? <laughs> I haven't heard of facial yoga. Oh my God, there's huge videos. I mean, literally, I mean, I'm almost, in, I was like practicing that. I'm like trying, but it's hard to keep up with. And like, how much do we need to do to make this work? And does it even work? Oh, you so, mean facial exercises? Is that Yes. Oh, okay. So yes. in my textbook, I have a whole section on facial exercises. Okay. And um, there's not a lot of good studies. A couple showed maybe you looked a little better. A couple showed maybe you looked a little worse. There's no kind of standardization about what the exercises are. So we don't really know. But but if you think about what Botox and Discord are, is they're relaxing your muscles so that they don't move. So you wrinkle less. So it seems like if you're moving more, you'd wrinkle more. But it all depends on what muscles you're using. So I, I feel like the jury's still out on that one. They haven't figured it out. Yeah. Well, you know what I don't like? I don't like how I like to sleep on my left side. And I feel like my wrinkles are worse on that side. <laughs> yeah. And everybody has a worse side. And I did a study once to try to figure out, is it the side of the car that you're on and the, where you're getting the sun? Is it what side you sleep on? Is okay. it what side you hold your phone? but we couldn't find um, anything that correlated. So it might just be genetic. So, yeah. So um, one other thing we talked about um, photo aging, but I wanted to ask you, is it permanent or, you know, once it's there, are there things we can do to reverse it? I hate to say yes, because then people won't be as careful in the sun. <laughs> because the sun is so bad. But we know, um, in fact, the, uh, the guy, Albert Kligman, who invented Retin-A, told this story about a patient who had really bad sun damage. I think it was a farmer or somebody who had a lot of sun exposure who had a, an accident and was in a coma and was in a dark room for 20 years and all their wrinkles went away. Wow. Because they had no sun exposure. So we know that your skin can replace itself, but only if you're doing great habits. And, and what's absolutely proven are retinoids. Retinoids will, re will regenerate your skin and will improve photo aging for sure. I mean, no doubt there's hundreds and hundreds of studies to prove it. Okay. You need to be on the highest strength you can tolerate every single day. And then they've looked to see what happens if you do it three times a week, what happens if you stop for six months. And it looks like if you do it, once you get to where you want to be, if you stay three times a week, you can maintain that. But if you stop after six months, you start to go back to how you were. So really, I tell my patients, get on a retinoid and stay on it unless until they invent something better. But what about under the eyes? I feel like it dries me out just under there. Is it you still can, good to put on there? Uh -huh, but, and you can dilute it out with a moisturizer. I put it on anything that I don't want to age. So neck, chest, hands, arms. I've been using it on my hands. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes it, you'll see a difference. In, like people who do their face and don't do their neck, you can, their neck looks older. Oh, wow. All right, cool. Definitely. All right, so. Where can everybody find you? Where is access to your skin tools? And um, yeah, so they can find out more about this and do this and, you know, start treating their skin the right way. So if you go to skintypesolutions.com, that's where you can take the quiz and find out the ideal red for you and choose products of many, many brands that, that are right for your skin type. 
So that's skintypesolutions.com. And you also can follow that on social media. Um, on there, I'm very proud of all the blogs on there. I write blogs like crazy. They're all written by me. So whatever topic, I, I haven't written an autophagy one yet, but whatever other topics you can search and you'll find in, under the library, you'll find all the blogs that I've written and they're very up to date. Right now I'm working on clean ingredients and explaining to people what that means and what ingredients are clean and, and all that, which is very controversial and very interesting. If you want to follow me personally, the best place really is LinkedIn. But I get so many messages that um, don't be mad if you DM me and I don't get back to you because I just half of them are people trying to sell me stuff. So I don't really yeah. read my messages very much on there. Um, and then that's, those are really the best ways in my textbook, Cosmetic Dermatology. It's going to be called Bauman's Cosmetic Dermatology. They're adding my name to the textbook this time. That's going to be out probably, I mean, it's going to press now. So in the next couple of months, that'll be on Amazon. You can look me up on Amazon. So those are really the best ways. I mean, I have my, my little personal Instagram and stuff like yeah. that. If you want to follow my medical practice, it's Bauman Cosmetic. And we're talking more about procedures. But I think for your viewers, they'll probably like Skin Type Solutions the best because we're educating you about skincare science on all the social media channels and then um, all the blogs on the website. The and that's blogs are great. Right and thanks. And also you can yeah. buy Xerophyte there. Xerophyte is, um, you can only get that from doctors unless you go to skintypesolutions.com. Yeah, I was on your blog. That's why I came up with all those questions. You were probably like, wow. I mean, like, I was like, oh yeah, but what about this? I mean, your blogs are excellent. They're easy to understand, broken down. Um, they're really great. Okay. Um, well, is there anything that I didn't ask you or you feel is important to discuss or mention? Um, no, I think you got everything. I mean, my goal is really to, to empower everyone to make the right skincare decisions. So we all have healthier skin. And if we can encourage our friends and everyone, uh, like I said, take the quiz, it's free. Um, I'm, we're doing it to try to make to educate you. It's not a scam like a lot of the quizzes. So please help me spread the word. That's all I ask is, we don't have a huge marketing budget to go tell the world about it. Um, you know, I'm a doctor helping other doctors. So I would really, yeah. any help of getting the word out would be great. And I really appreciate you having me on your call today yeah. because as we get all that data and we learn what skin types are more common, we have 300,000 people's data as far as what skin types are more common, right. but those are from dermatology offices. So it's skewed data. It's people mm -hmm. with a problem. So getting that data online or people who are not at a dermatologist's office, we're going to get to see the differences and, and we can talk to cosmetic companies and say, listen, this is an underserved group. For example, dry skin people with acne who are allergic, they have a tough time finding products. So if we could go to a company and say there's 50,000 people who need an acne drug that's not going to irritate them and they have dry skin, yeah. then we could get companies to make these products. Yeah. I mean, good skin is so important, not only for our health and well being, but just our, you know, the way we feel about ourselves. And it's not everything, but it does make a huge impact. I know, especially for the my girls that, are, you know, they're like, I mean, if they have a pimple, they think it's like ruining their day. I'm like, are you kidding me? Just wait. <laughs> wait till right. You're dealing with wrinkles and you know, but it's so reminds cool. me. Because your girls are young, the, the skin type quiz works for age 13 and up. Okay. So even if you have kids that are teenagers, um, my, my boys were teenagers whenever I did all of this, um, that it works for them as well. We just haven't tested it in under 13. That's so good to know. I didn't even think about it with my 14 year old son, cause he's having breakouts and I actually have an appointment next week and that's so, I'm going to have him do it. That's a good idea. Yeah. You might be able to postpone acne medicine just by getting him on the right cleanser. Chances yeah. are a little salicylic acid cleanser and a retinol will go a long way for him. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. All right. Well, thanks so much. I have loved talking to you. I think this is just such a fun topic and it's so cool. Everything that's coming. It's like a great time to be alive. Just knowing all of this stuff for our overall health and disease prevention and skin health. It's huge. Right. And there are some cool technologies coming out in the next six months that I'm not allowed to talk about yet, but I think they're going to be game changers too. Is so it in that. your book? No, it's so oh. new. It wasn't <laughs> even in the book. Oh. I just found out about it about a month ago and the science is very exciting. Wow. 
Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Good to talk to you. And I hope we can stay in touch. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>